Jordan making a goblin with a goblin rabble master. So perhaps this game going much better for Todd as he also has just played the Temple of the Fifth. New top card going to the bottom. And we'll see where Jason is at. Jason will sacrifice a windswept heath. And if he's doing that right now, I would imagine we're looking at one of his six mana plays. He does have an Elspeth Sons champion in the sideboard. And this would be a pretty good spot for Elspeth. I wouldn't dislike this spot for Elspeth. Because it sure. would resolve. And that's yeah. pretty sweet. Here's four mana. That's a Siege Rhino. So Coleman going to gain some life here. Anderson will lose some. And now a follow up play here for Jason. Tremoka's command. Rhino will get a little bigger. Rebel Master will bite the dust. Let's Command also makes sense in that spot. Yeah. Six mana is worth a place. Yeah. Treasure Cruise to draw here for Anderson. Todd's hand looks stocked right now. I mean, Siege Rhino is pretty big, but Stoke, Just Guy, Ascendancy, Treasure Cruise, another Rabble Master. Can he work his way through a 5 6 Siege Rhino? Yeah, you don't want to take those kind of chip shots. It, it is a bit of a hole in the armor in the Jeskai token plan. It's just big tramplers are pretty good. Siege Rhino uh, being the most common one. You do have Valorous Stance now. You can play with Roast, what have you. But this is the card, in my opinion, that causes tokens to lose the most frequently from spots where it looks like the game's going pretty well for them. Setting aside huge plays like Ugin and so forth, in terms of three, four, five mana plays, it's, it's Siege Rhino. Anderson will play a Rabble Master. Goblin tokens. We're going to stoke the flames, go upstairs. Doesn't want to lose those Goblin tokens here. He'll pass the turn back. Coleman on tap. Looks like just one card in hand, so he'll take a draw step. Todd trying to put enough pressure on Jason that he maybe has to hold back, but... He has no interest in that. Here comes Siege Rhino. With, with Todd with a million spells in hand, uh, that's a good reason to attack, yeah, too. Yeah, I would agree. <laughs> Drown and Sorrow is going to clear everything up and allow Jason to scry. Take a look at that top card. Very quick, he's going to become the bottom card. Yeah, Jason just has to race here. Uh, we're coming in kind of mid-conversation, so we don't know exactly what's been going on, but Todd's got so much in his hand. Jason's working with very little. Valor Stance is a timely draw there for Anderson. That's going to get Siege Rhino off of the table. See if there will be a follow-up play here for Todd. It'll be a copy of Jeskai Ascendancy. He'll pass the turn back over to Jason. It's a good turn there for Todd. Yep. See if Jason can keep up. Wingmate Rock in the air isn't too bad. Todd does have that checked right now with his copy of Stoke the Flames in hand. Hordling Outburst to draw. Can't be too unhappy with that. And it may have looked weird last turn where Todd played Valorous Stance and then went ahead and uh, played the Ascendancy after the fact. I think the logic there is in the event that it didn't work for some reason, you know, there's some way to protect it on Jason's side. Todd can then, un instead of playing the Ascendancy, can then treasure Cruise and look for help. Cruise does resolve. Here's Outburst, trigger Ascendancy. Anderson looks like he's going to discard a Battlefield Forge, and he will. Three goblins on the way. And this is why, in my opinion, Jason's the beatdown in this matchup, even though he's got some powerful late game cards like Elspeth and Wingmate Rock and so forth, is once we get to this stage, Todd's deck is on a whole different level of efficiency. Very, very hard to come back, because there's the Stoke the Flames trigger. Untap those creatures. Take a draw on your discard. Anderson, discard a mountain. Play a Temple of Triumph. It's a beautiful turn there for Todd. Uses all of his mana, uses a whole bunch of cards, gets the board clear, has an active ascendancy with creatures in play. Coleman could die next turn. Coleman will take a draw. All he can do is send it back Anderson's way. Anderson's draw now. And I think we're just going to be looking at lethal this turn, is my best guess. Here's an anticipate. That'll trigger ascendancy. Draw discard first. There goes Battlefield Forge. Now resolve the Anticipate. Take a look at a couple of cards. He's got two Stokes in hand. That's a combo with Just Guy Ascendancy. You and are correct. Couple of respects. There's Stoke number one. So much fun. Trigger. Discard. The 
looks like we're going to do it again. Jason will show a couple of lands. Let's head to a fifth game, shall we? As Todd Anderson ties things up here. Just Guy Tokens, Hobbs on aggro. They're going to game number five. What's important here for Jason, who's certainly underdog, he gets to be on the play. Yeah, that's a big deal here, uh, particularly with things like Drown and Sorrow and Bioblade. If Jason's able to get off to his early starts and Todd doesn't have a removal spell, if his draw's a little bit on the clunky side, the early removal spell can push Todd out of the game. Well, we're going to go to the sideboard, so you see Anderson's going to step away. So we'll bring these up first, and we will take a look at things here. Coleman going to be on the play for game five. You see his sideboard, lots of ones and twos there. Wishwood Elemental, Mastery of the Unseen, a Back to Nature, Bio Blight, Jeromoko's Command, Murderous Cut, two Valorous Stance, along with an Elspeth, three Drown and Sorrow, a Duress, and two Glare of Heresy. A lot to look over here. Yeah, I like the Drown and Sorrows, and we saw them in that game. I think Glare of Heresy is important for removing particular threats or just guy ascendancy. Bio Blight, very good here. We saw the Dromoka's Command in the deck. Uh, I would imagine that, you know, that's, that's coming out of the sideboard. There's two in the main deck. Jason probably went up to three. I don't know if he wants to go all the way up to Elspeth because I still think his late game could get trumped and Todd's bringing in some counters of his own. But the Drown and Sorrows and the cheap removal spells from Mocha's Command, Bio Blight, I think that's what Jason wants. Three Disdainful Stroke, two Negate, two Valor Stance, three Dragonlord Ojutai, and Elspeth, two Anger of the Gods, and two Glare of Heresies here for Anderson. Disable Stroke, very good here, as is Valorous Stance. I think the one Elspeth is fine as well. And Glare of Heresy is a good removal spell. It, we just want answers to a lot of what Jason's doing, I think. I, I do agree with you. I think Jason has to be the aggro in this matchup. Can't really be the beat. I know it's an obs on aggro deck, but he can't afford to be a slower deck. As we saw in that game, once Jeskai Sentency gets going, Jason's not really going to be able to keep up. Yeah, Todd's got cards like Treasure Cruise. He's got counter spells to keep Jason's big stuff off balance. Uh, I, I think that Jason's favored in the early game with good threats and then leveraged by some early removal spells. But as we get later and later, Todd's deck, they're just on different levels in terms of raw power. Todd's deck, when it's humming on all cylinders, it looks like a modern deck. And uh, Jason's deck is definitely a standard level deck. Well, we'll take a look at the tail of the tape for these two players. You'll see exactly how they got here. Anderson, 7-1 and one in standard. Coleman, 6-2. and two. Anderson, 6-2 and two in legacy with Infect. Coleman, 6-1-1 one one with Lands in Legacy. Lands was kind of a metagame deck that we felt with the right matchups would be a good choice, and Coleman certainly ran into him. It is one of the more polarized decks in all of Legacy. Your creature matchups generally are extremely good. Your combo matchups are quite bad. With a 6-1-1 one one record, I'm assuming he ran primarily into creature decks. Of course, Anderson with his four Grand Prix top eights, invitational winner in Atlanta in 2013. 21 Open Series top eights, a handful of wins for Coleman. He's probably the least known name in this top eight, but certainly off to a great start here going to game five against Anderson. Grand Prix, New Jersey, 23rd place. Lost his last round to get his invite to the Pro Tour, so a crushing loss there. And then Grand Prix, Washington, D.C., 35th place as Anderson has returned to the table. Going to get ready for game number five here. Again, Coleman going to be on the play. Certainly big for the Obs on Aggro deck. Just got to hope that the mana comes together appropriately. Yep, and, and also hoping that Todd kind of has some of those early stumbles where maybe the tokens deck doesn't have anything to do until turn three, lands that come into play tapped and so forth, and, and Jason can get on top of Todd before he's able to do much of anything. We already have three players through to our top four. On one side, we've got, we've got Reed Duke. And then we have Chris Anderson. Chris Anderson knocking out Michael Braverman. What a tournament for Braverman, too. I know he's out of the tournament now, but, you know, for the first two days, this was all him. He was 13-0, and 0, I think, before he picked up his first loss. Yeah. Uh, was two wins ahead of the field at several points. 8-0 in the standard portion. But just ran into, uh, a, I think, a challenging matchup here and one that gets determined very early on in the game. Uh, we didn't get to watch it, but... Uh, Chris on to the semifinals. Chris's return to Magic has really been an inspiring story after taking a sabbatical. He's come back, made the top eight at the Open Series in Columbus the first week of the year, won a PTQ to go to the Pro Tour in Brussels a couple weeks from now, and now has an invitational top eight on his resume, among the other things that he has done in the Open Series. For Duke, well, there's not much we can say. He is one of the game's very best, and Chris is going to have a tough road ahead of him. He Reed played just so well in his top eight match, and it's it's almost silly to say at this point because... We walk away saying that every time we watch Reed play, but uh, those games against Joe, particularly the post-board games, which Reed won all three of, and game four in particular, were just clinics on a management of resources and having both a an excellent tactical and strategic grasp on the game. The other side of things, of course, Jacob Wilson just, it was ugly. If we're just going to be honest, it was ugly. 
it was one-sided, man. I thought that I thought honestly Ross was going to get that third game. It was looking good with a turn three Zeniko on the play, play, but the top deck drown and sorrow there from Jacob shut the door, and the other two games were not very competitive. Yeah, I'm not sure how that matchup typically plays out, but it feels like I was not in control. Given what we saw, it feels like he's just going to win more often than not. Well, it, it's one of those things where I feel like Ross needs Jacob to stumble in a big way. If Jacob does, Ross's deck is fast enough to capitalize, but, you know, the four and five mana plays in his deck really didn't get much of an opportunity to do much in the face of Hero's Downfall and Ultimate Price. Ross never drew Stormbreath Dragon. That's one of his better cards, maybe his best card in the matchup. And his other creatures, the, the Sorok, the, the other dragons, they're pretty easy for Jacob to answer. Of course, we got to figure out who's going to win and move on to play against Jacob Wilson between Todd Anderson and Jason Coleman. Again, game five going to be underway for you guys in just a moment, but we take a look at the prizes here that are available to these players. At the min, they're walking away with $2,000, so it's a pretty nice weekend for these gentlemen. But only one person going to walk away with $10,000, 35 Open Series points, their likeness on a card, and an invite to our Players' Championship. And for our players competing right now, you know, if you looked at the, the top eight, you would say only Ross really looks likely to qualify through some other path in the Invitational. Maybe Todd decides to turn it on and start playing in a lot more Opens, but uh, for the players still left competing, this is uh, their best chance to get to the Players' Championship. We already got two players qualified. Brad Nelson, of course, the defending champion. Jim Davis, our season one points champion. We've got to figure out who that third person is going to be, and eventually we'll figure out the other 13. It's going to be a long season. Season two is going to be short. I mean, it's about two months. Yep. So we're going to get two more slots determined very quickly after this tournament. But uh, for these players, an opportunity that otherwise wouldn't really be afforded to them. December 19th and the 20th, Star City Game Center in Roanoke, Virginia, is where 16 competitors will duke it out for $50,000. First place, a cool 20 k it was a great tournament last year. I know we have some updates for the structure coming down the pipeline. Yep. Still in the laboratory. Very excited to roll that out once we get a little bit closer. But it should be a lot of fun. It was uh, Getting to cover the event was incredible. Watching the players uh, bond with one another. They were competitors the entire year, but uh, they obviously valued the experience they got to share with each other. And I know everyone that I talked to that qualified last year is looking to get back. And they do want to make it back. And Brad Nelson, of course, defending champion. He'll be back. Jim Davis. Didn't have the best player's championship. He even admitted that. He really wanted to have a better performance. He'll get his shot again, given all the work he did in season one. And assuming, uh, unless Reed wins the Invitational, it does mean that we're going to have a new roster of players for 2015. Yeah. We're going to have one new head here at least, unless Reed wins, which I guess would not be particularly surprising. No, I don't think it would be very surprising <laughs> at all. Jason has stepped away from the table to mentally prepare himself for game number five. He has returned now, so we will see who will win this thing between Todd Anderson and Jason Coleman, Abzan Agro and Jeskai Tokens. Of course, if you guys are looking for the deck list that these players are playing, maybe some of the deck techs that we've done over the course of the weekend on the sideboard with Nick Miller and Ken Crocker, definitely head over to the Star City Games coverage page. It's a brand new standard format, and it looks to be a good one. This is going to be a very influential tournament for what the Pro Tour looks like in a couple weeks. Uh, I think they're going to see a lot of adaptations on the strategies, but there's a lot of information if you're looking for information for the Pro Tour, if you're interested in participating in the state championships that weekend, you know, IQs, PPTQs, Syracuse next week, whatever. There's a lot of information to go through. Looking forward to finding out how this standard format will develop over the course of the next couple of months because Dragonstar here is a pretty awesome set with a lot of awesome new content. Just Guy Tokens looks pretty good. Abzan Agro's got some new additions, but perhaps Abzan Control with what we saw from Jacob Wilson is the deck to beat. It was very dominant in that match against Marion. I certainly liked what I saw. Yes, well, in that matchup, it looked great. Uh, the Joe Bass versus Reed Duke matchup, not so much. Not so good. Looked okay. Just wasn't, it was good, it just wasn't Reed Duke good, you know? A few things are. <laughs> Game number five is going to be underway here shortly. If you are just joining us, we appreciate having you. Cedric Phillips, Patrick Sullivan, of course, Matthias Hunt, along with Nick Miller and Ken Crocker and the rest of the SCG Live crew bringing you our Season 1 Invitational from Richmond, Virginia. At SCG Live, hashtag SCG Envy. For your tweets, as we make it through our third and final day of coverage, we do have a two-day 20K standard open taking place behind us. So once we have more results of that, you guys can certainly look at those deck lists. We'll have the top 32 Eventually, we'll crown a champion, give someone $5,000 there, along with 25 Open Series points, qualification to our Season 2 Invitational. Also, I have a Legacy and Modern Premier IQ taking place as well, so for those of you who are fans of older formats, we'll have more results about that. Maybe Dragons Tarkir has influenced those formats as well. Invitational weekends are so sweet, particularly when we're basically doing a pre-release. It's a pre-release across all the formats. Yeah. 
So a lot of deck lists to go through after the fact, particularly for standard, where we're just going to have a deep library from the Invitational and then from the Open as well. Coleman will be on the play with his OBS on aggro deck. We'll see if the mana lines up appropriately. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't with this deck. When it does, it's very good. He will keep his opener. Anderson will take a look at his. He's happy, happy. Game number five underway. Coleman with the Sansep Citadel. Anderson will scry his top card to the bottom with the Temple of Triumph. Coleman with the Lanawar Waste. Predictably taking one from that to play a Fleece Main Lion. This is the first big test of the game here. If Todd can kill this, that's great. And if not, and it looks like the answer is going to be not, if Jason can follow up with a three here, Todd might just double a little bit too much. Temple of Epiphany there for Anderson. Back Coleman's way. The first two, sometimes three turns of the game for Jeskai Tokens can be really harrowing, especially against opponents who are putting on pressure. There goes Fleece main line. Does Coleman have a follow-up? He has a land that enters the battlefield tapped in Temple of Malady. He'll take a look at that top card. We'll see where it's going to go. And the big thing here is if Jason has a follow-up, because if he doesn't, uh, even if Todd's third turn doesn't really impact the board too, too much, uh, he can be fine. He can get an Ascendancy into play and, and untap and start firing, get a Route Master into play and start to race. But if there's a follow-up here and Todd isn't able to break serve at the end of Jason's turn, that's bad news. There is no follow-up. There's a Glare of Harris at the top of Anderson's deck. Mystic Monastery passing in the turn for Todd. He's got to be pretty happy there was no follow-up there. Yeah, for sure. And Todd scried out to the top. He didn't just Maverick that. <laughs> <laughs> Not the Green White Legacy deck, but the movie. Showing your age is what you're doing right That's now. That's a classic. Is it? I've never seen it. <laughs> Don't even know what it's about. It's uh, one of those so bad it's good type of movies. Oh, yes, a classic. Yeah. But the blind throwing of a card off the deck. Ah, I see. Here's a planes off of Windswept Heath. Two mana will allow Jason to deploy another Fleece Main Line and just pass the turn back. So it's a slow start here for Jason, giving Todd the opportunity to maybe get his shop set up. And I wonder if that was, uh, you know, maybe that Fleece Main Line was drawn or maybe it was a concession to the anger of the gods that are in Todd's sideboard. There's a Shivan Reef and a passing of the turn. We head back Coleman's way. Coleman will play a fifth land. And with Fleece Main Line, he's going to come. Could go monstrous if he wants to. I mean, that's that's some serious risk. Mm. How about a wingmate rock? A little bit safer. <laughs> Here's an anticipating response. Got to find a disdainful stroke right here. That's, that's the idea. He missed. Wingmate rock is going to resolve along with its friend. When we go back to Anderson's way. He's got some real catching up to do now. Yeah, now even if Todd has brought in the Anger of the Gods, not totally sure. Um, yeah, you can see with his reaction, his hand's not great. But he kept a very slow one. He kept one that didn't start until turn three. Uh, he scried that Glare of Heresy to the top of his deck. And these are the type of openings where Tokens looks like a fair and honest deck. Yeah. He just spends the first couple of turns spinning his tires. And if you're just spending your mana doing stuff, if the token stack doesn't have one of its big catch-up cards like Anger of the Gods or raise the alarm if you're tagging with a bunch of 1-1s one and so forth, uh, you can fall behind. This is one of those times is there's a Jeskai Ascendancy. Shiv and Reef and Abbas in the turn where Todd needed something that turn, maybe like a Dragon Lord Ojitai to maybe stabilize things, but he did not have that. Yep. If you even brought in Dragon Lord Ojitai, which I think is questionable. Yeah. Coleman with a dominating board right now. Going to go to the attack step. Everybody's coming in. Trigger the wingmate rock. A little bit of life gain here. And I'd be surprised if Jason makes a move here. His board's so commanding that if Todd's willing to pass, uh, Jason's likely willing to pass as well. And he's just going to play one sub teeth and pass the turn back. 
Anderson will draw. It's going to have to be a really good one. It's just an island. I think the only spell in his hand to fire off the ascendancy is another ascendancy. Yeah, and all he can do is extend the hand. Jason Coleman's going to win this game and match over Todd Anderson. Three games to two. Hobbs on aggro will take care of Jeskai Tokens. Coleman with a bit of an upset here, and he's got another tough task in front of him in Jacob Wilson. Yeah, I, I like the matchup from his side of the table there. I think, you know, on the spectrum of mulligans a lot and mulligans not very much, I think Todd is much closer to the mulligans not very much side of thing. That's that's the sort of hand where if he finds something to do on the turn two, it's, it's spectacular. If he doesn't and Jason has any sort of reasonable draw, he's going to be in trouble. And it was the second scenario. Uh, Jason's draw was fine. It wasn't even spectacular. It was just fine. Uh, Todd didn't have anything to do until the third turn of the game, and Jason just overwhelmed him. Todd could never get anything going. Jason.